welcome to the Judeo-Christian Studies lecture. Um, I'm Rana Berger. I'm in the philosophy department. I'm the director of this lecture series. Uh, and I'm very excited tonight to have Christine Hayes, our guest speaker. For the, and we're also grateful to the Hugh McCloskey Evans Memorial Lecture for making this possible. And please, I'd like to introduce Charles Evans back there. Uh, grandson of our original donor, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to sneak in, um, I want to introduce uh, Professor Hazelman, but I want to sneak in for a minute because I see so many of you undergraduates that out there on the table, we are in the midst of trying to establish a religious studies minor at Tulane, which we don't have now. Uh, it'll be fun, not too much, a few courses, a way of letting students know uh, courses going on each semester that I think might be of interest to you or maybe bringing some students with common interests together at events like this. So if you uh, have any interest, please sign up. There's a sign-up sheet out there. Just give me your name and email just to, for me to keep you up to date uh, about how we progress with that. And I should add that courses you've already taken or will be taking, including perhaps my Bible course next semester, I'm putting in a plug for that, Bible and Philosophy, uh, or Professor Wolf's World Religions course, these are, uh, will count if this minor goes through. So uh, please let me know by email if you have any interest, and I'll keep you posted on our progress. OK, let's uh, turn to the reason we're all here tonight. Uh, I want to introduce Christine Hayes, who is the Robert and Patricia Weiss Professor of Religious Studies at Yale, where she's taught since 1996. Before that, she taught for several years in the Princeton Near Eastern Studies Department. She received her uh, undergraduate degree from Harvard and her PhD from the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Berkeley. At Yale, Professor Hayes teaches courses on the literature and history of the biblical and Talmudic periods. She was awarded recently the uh, prize for teaching excellence in the humanities. And I have a feeling you will soon understand why. I wish I had time to say just a little about her impressive and fascinating books. Her first, between, entitled Between the Babylonian and Palestinian Talmuds, was honored with the Sallow Baron Prize for a first book in Jewish thought and literature. The next one, Gentile Impurities and Jewish Identities, Intermarriage and Conversion from the Bible to the Talmud, a really intriguing topic, which I learned a little about today talking with Chris. Uh, one in, was a National Jewish Book Award finalist. Now, dipping into the Talmud is a daunting experience. You really confront unfamiliar ways of thinking. But I think uh, Christine Hayes really knows how to bring it to life. That's what I'm discovering, and I think you'll get a taste tonight. Uh, she's also published a very helpful textbook, The Emergence of Judaism, Classical Traditions in Contemporary Perspectives. And students in several of our classes, Professor Raymer's class, my Bible class, know her book, Introduction to the Bible. This book is connected with her Yale online course, Introduction to the Bible, which is just wonderful. I really urge everyone to take a glance at it online. I'm very worried about professors getting replaced by online courses, but really this is a a wonderful uh, opportunity, like second best to being in her classroom at Yale. So, now her most recent book, which is the basis for the talk tonight, What's Divine About Divine Law? Newly minted. Uh, is in, it's an examination of the classical and biblical sources of the concept of divine law. And I think that's a really fundamental issue for the whole Western tradition. And you know, many of us here, myself and some of the graduate students, are studying Greek philosophy, some people studying the Bible. These are the roots of our tradition. And the notion of divine law, which uh, shouldn't be taken for granted, which we are going to hear about tonight, is so fundamental to that. So I think we'll be very fortunate to have a glimpse of that this evening. Thank you, and please welcome. Professor Hayes.
My thanks to Rana Berger and to the Evans family and the, Judeo, the Judeo-Christian Studies Lecture Series for this invitation to speak with you this evening. I'm really delighted to be here. Also, thanks to Rana and her colleagues and her students who have um, not wined, because I don't drink wine really, but dined me um, <laughs> extensively. And it's been quite lovely to enjoy your hospitality. I'm very happy. Um, and, and thanks also to you for um, joining us uh, tonight. Uh, the lecture that I've prepared um, follows the main argument of the new book that Rana uh, mentioned to you, um, which I wanted to call What's So Divine About Divine Law, but Princeton University Press didn't think I should have such a flip title for such a serious book, so they made it What's Divine About Divine Law. Um, the book labors to make sense of the explosive confrontation of radically diverse concepts of divine law in the Mediterranean and Near Eastern world in the thousand year period before the rise of Islam. So I don't really do anything after the seventh century. That's postmodern as far as I'm concerned. I stick to the pre seventh century. And divine law refers to the idea that the norms that guide human actions should somehow be rooted or are somehow rooted in the divine realm. And that's a concept that's common to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There's nothing inevitable about this idea. I don't know for a fact, but I've been told by experts in, in Chinese um, civilization, for example, that, that they don't think of law as divine. They think of it as attached to the wisdom of sages or elders, but not necessarily divine. In ancient Near Eastern culture, um, the gods are said to authorize kings. Right? They give them principles of justice, um, and they confer wisdom upon them. Um, but the laws themselves are written by the kings and are known by the king's names, right? The Code of Hammurabi, for example. So a robust notion of divine law in which divinity attaches or applies in some manner to the law itself first appears in ancient Greece and in the Hebrew Bible um, or the Old Testament. And that's where the story of the book begins, and this is why it begins. Um, the Greek and the biblical conceptions of the divine are radically different. And to the extent that they conceived of the divine in radically different ways, then their notions of divine law would also diverge quite dramatically. And after Alexander conquers the eastern end of the Mediterranean, these two conceptions of divine law are going to collide with one another and create a cognitive dissonance that had very serious consequences for those who felt compelled to negotiate the claims of both of those traditions, felt some fidelity in some sense to both of those traditions. And for the most part, those people were ancient Jews. So what does it mean to say that law is divine? What constitutes divine law's divinity? When we say that a law is divine, what claims are we making on its behalf? What are the traits that we suppose a law possesses when we refer to it as divine? Hence my question, what's divine about divine law? Well, we get two answers in antiquity. Right? In much of Greek thought, divine law is divine, and here I'm quoting um, a scholar by the name of Bragg, um, divine law is divine because it expresses the profound structures of a permanent natural order. It's a natural law. The Stoics, and I'm going to be very schematic here, so please forgive me, it's a 400-page book, so if you want details, you can go there, but I'm going to be very schematic. The Stoics were the first to refer to the natural law, which they understood to be a kind of rational order, or a logos, uh, in the universe, to refer to it as a divine law, theos nomos. It's not a term that occurs frequently. But for the Stoics, God was not distinct from nature. God was nature, and nature was divine. Therefore, the rational order, or the eternal reason, or logos of nature, is none other than the eternal reason of God. So we can refer to natural law as divine law. So to say that there is a divine law, or that a law is divine, is to say that it's the eternal reason, or rational order, of nature, or the eternal mind of God. Cicero gives um, the classic account of the Stoic theory of natural law, or divine law. And you'll see that on your handout. I should actually explain this handout. Um, the first two pages of the handout are kind of a charting of the talk, okay? So um, you can sort of set that aside and refer to it now and again if you kind of want to know where we are. But then sources begin on page three. So the first source, or text one, is from Cicero. Cicero explains that according to the Stoics, there is only one true law, namely right reason. True law is right reason, in agreement with nature, right? Diffused over everyone, meaning universal, consistent, meaning that it's unchanging, immutable, and everlasting. It's eternal. All right? So divine law for the Greeks is, is rational, it's truth, 
It's universal, it's eternal, and it's unchangeable. It's static in its perfection. And very important for the Stoics, it's unwritten. It isn't formulated in human language, in words or statements. Right? It's not commands and prohibitions. It's a natural order, a rational order by which the world operates. To invalidate it by human legislation um, is never morally right. It's not permissible to restrict it or annul it in any way, right? natural law. So its authority lies in the qualities that it possesses, its rationality, its truth, its universality, and not because it's backed by the coercive power of a legislator. Now, when it comes to law, uh, Greco-Roman thought in general assumes a very important binary or dichotomy. On the one hand, there's natural or divine law that I've just described. And on the other hand, separate and quite distinct from the natural law, there's what we call human positive law or legislation, which is not in a genuine sense law. Right? Positive law, the laws that humans posit. That's why they're called positive law. Positive law consists of concrete rules and prohibitions that are posited by human beings and delivered in written form, in words and sentences, and enforced by a coercive authority, a sovereign body that issues them. Positive human law is not universal. It's created by local communities or the polis um, for a particular city or a particular state. It's subject to change and evolution over time as needs change over time. It doesn't reflect truth or natural reality. We don't stop at a red light because somehow metaphysically and ontologically redness makes us halt. You know, we stop at a red light because we've agreed to stop at a red light. We could change that tomorrow if we decided people were suddenly becoming colorblind and could no longer see red. We might pick a different color. So Greco-Roman uh, discourses of positive human law are ambivalent to negative. So you'll see on the first page of the handout where I'm sort of charting things. I'm, what I'm doing first is running through some Greco-Roman discourses of law, divine law and positive law. How do they talk about divine law, which I just explained for you? And now how do they talk about positive human laws? In general, the discourses of positive human laws in Greco-Roman tradition are ambivalent to negative. In Plato's Republic and in the laws, the only true and virtuous regime is a regime of direct rule by the gods, which happened in a past mythological age. But we now live in a fallen state. There is no more direct rule by the gods. Now the next best thing would be to be ruled by philosopher kings, whose rational capacity is perfected to such a degree that, like, that they, like the gods, perceive eternal truths. But it's really hard to find such philosophers, as Plato says in the laws, and this is text two. I grant you readily that if ever, by God's mercy, a man were born with the capacity to attain to this perception, this rational perfection where he could read the rational natural law, um, he would need no laws to govern him. No law or ordinance, whatever, has the right to sovereignty over true knowledge of the order of the universe, right? But as things are, such insight is nowhere to be met with. There are very few rationally perfect human beings or philosophers around, except in faint vestiges. And so we have to choose the second best, ordinance and law. Lacking divine rulers or even rationally perfect philosopher kings, we're forced to make do with the second best, rule by laws. Um, it's a second best option. The law strives to be an imitation of the truth, Plato says, but actually it is a resented necessity that takes place under the sign of shame. Indeed, the rule of law represents a failure of education altogether because according to Plato, the truly rational individual would grasp eternal verities and wouldn't need laws at all. No law is superior to knowledge. But since few are truly knowledgeable, we must choose again the second best option of rule by law. For Plato, the imperfection of the human laws that govern us lies in their generality combined with their inflexibility, which means they are unable to adjust as needed to ensure justice in all of the widely varying circumstances of human life. Text three is from Plato's work, The Law uh, uh, Statesman, it says here. Okay, yes, I guess it's from The Statesman. I thought it was from The Laws. Um, law could never accurately embrace what is best and most just for all at the same time, and so prescribe what is best for the dissimilarities among human beings and their actions and the fact that practically nothing in human affairs ever remains stable prevent any sort of expertise whatsoever from making any simple decision in any sphere that covers all cases and will last for all time that is in fact from the statesman so in other words because no written human law can anticipate all of the circumstances of specific cases 
the fact that it is written down and therefore fixed and inflexible is a serious flaw. It would be best to be ruled not by a static written law, but by sages and wise experts who can make adjustments and make decisions on the spot in response to prevailing conditions. That's um, included in text four. Um, like a ship's captain who makes adjustments on the spot. The ship's captain fixes his attention on the real welfare at any given time of his ship and his crew. He lays down no written enactments. He doesn't decide in advance of the journey exactly what the ship is going to do. He's checking conditions at all time and accommodating through a practical application of his knowledge of seamanship, he's accommodating the needs of the voyage. And in that way, he preserves the lives of all in his ship. Other Greek thinkers also praise the living law, the nomos and psychos of the kings, um, as more flexible than the dead letter of written codes. So these are all negative discourses about written human laws. For Aristotle, the legislator who cleaves to written law and precedent without employing phronesis, practical wisdom, practical reasoning, or practical judgment, to make the proper adjustments in individual cases, that person is defective. In the Nicomachean Ethics, and here I've given you a quote, um, text five, we won't read it all, but in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle discusses the need for equity, that is to say, correction of the law in individual cases, because it's impossible for humans to lay down a law that will, in all cases, be just, right? So we could say, that in divorce cases, custody should always go to the mother. But we can all imagine many individual cases in which that would be horribly unjust, right? And so equity would search for general, the, the best welfare and would adjust that law in any given particular circumstance. So for both Plato and Aristotle, even the best human law must recognize its imperfection and take into account shifting human needs and circumstances if it is to deliver justice in individual circumstances. Ambivalence about human law is also found in Plato's dialogue, Protagoras, in the great speech given by Protagoras, as well as in Plato's laws, where it's stated that although human law provides an important um, rescue from the brutish state of nature, right, without laws, it's a jungle, um, it's still deficient. It can't ever help us achieve the full realization of virtue. Um, because law has us doing good things for the wrong reason, just because we, won't, we don't want to be punished, right? And not because we have a rational knowledge um, that leads us through knowledge to, to choose to, do, to act in a virtuous way. So law rescues us from the jungle, but it doesn't bring us to full virtue. Law, Plato says in the laws, is in itself, is itself in need of a savior, soterion, in the form of logos or reason in order to adjust its general and incomplete rulings to particular circumstances. So again, I'm stressing this because we're going to see in a moment how different the Talmudic rabbis are. Um, those adjustments of the law are needed because human laws are imperfect. They can't cover all or anticipate all eventualities. They are defective, he says, owing to their universality. So to sum up, Ancient Greeks, or at least this strand of ancient Greek thought that I'm following in the book, I talk about 10 or so different discourses of the law, so this is very schematic. But ancient Greeks, uh, along this philosophical track, would have answered the question, what's divine about divine law, by asserting that divine law is divine by virtue of certain qualities it possesses, qualities inherent in it. First and foremost, its rationality, which entails its truth value, its universality, and its static, unchanging character, qualities that positive human laws simply don't have. By contrast, according to biblical tradition, the law is divine not by virtue of any inherent quality or qualities that it possesses, but because it emanates from a God who is the master of history. Now, that's a very different idea of divine law. Biblical divine law is divine because it's authored by, it's the command of, it expresses the will of a deity. It's not the expression of an impersonal natural law or logos or order in the cosmos. Rather, the divine law of biblical tradition possesses the features that in the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition would typically be associated with human positive law. It's a body of legislation. It has rules. It has commandments that emanate from a divine being, yes, and express that deity's will. But its authority isn't grounded in its rational character. It's grounded in its commanding source. In Exodus 24, we read, Moses went and repeated to the people all the commands of the Lord and all the rules 
And all the people answered with one voice, saying, All the things that the Lord has commanded, we will do. And Moses then wrote down all the commands of the Lord. So this divine law is written. It's not an unwritten rational order, but concrete legislation formulated in words. And it's designed for a particular, specific community. Indeed, when it's given, God says he's giving it to the Israelites to separate them from other communities, to make them distinct. The separatist purpose of the law explains why there are commandments and prohibitions that seem to lack any rational basis. It's the very arbitrariness of those laws that ensures that they will be different and mark this people as different, not doing what others do. Moreover, because the divine law is a positive enactment of a sovereign will, it's changeable because that which stems from an act of will can be changed by a subsequent act of will. New rules and ordinances can be issued as long as there's continued access to God's will. And in biblical times, this is achieved by means of just walking up and asking him, um, consulting God directly to ascertain what his, his will is. And in Deuteronomy 17, um, uh, there's a procedure for consulting with the authorities of the day when the law is not known or a new case arises. So variability of the divinely given law in response to the shifting circumstances of human life is part and parcel of the divine law. And the text says so quite explicitly. Deuteronomy 13 says, now that you're entering the land, um, you will perhaps want a king. And if you do, then this is how you should proceed. New situation, new rules. Um, Numbers 27 is a very famous case of the daughters of Tzalafachad who come with a legal claim to Moses and say that perhaps they should inherit um, because there are no sons. And instead of the inheritance going to the brothers, it should come to the daughters when there are no sons. And Moses takes it to God, and God says, you know, you're right. That's actually a really good idea. Moses, write it down. We're going to do it that way from now on. New situation, new rules. So biblical tradition portrays God as a divine sovereign commanding and enacting laws for his covenant partner, Israel. Certainly, and again, I'm schematizing here. I have a long section in the book that talks about the fact that this portrayal is nuanced and it's complicated by other trends in biblical tradition that emphasize the role of wisdom in the law um, and describe the law as teaching and instruction. So it does have some rational character, but it's still not an impersonal, rational logos in the universe. And there are also trends within the text that understand laws arising from the covenant relationship or the history of God with his people. Um, so those are all important uh, elements within the text, and I, I give them full consideration in, in the book. Um, so I do elaborate on the connection between the Torah and, and wisdom, at least. Um, we see that in the fact that some laws are given rationales, um, and also the fact that the Torah is embedded in a, in a narrative history of the relationship of God and Israel. But even though there are those other discourses of law, and I've sort of outlined them also on the first page of your handout, nevertheless, it remains true that the dominant, the dominant biblical depiction of divine law maintains that the divine law is grounded not in reason or a universal rational order, but in divine will, God's will for a particular people, actually, not universal mankind, in the form of written legislation that's designed to make them fit for life in a particular place, separate and distinct from other nations. Legislation that is not um, fixed or um, uh, static, but subject to change through historical time. So ancient adherence to biblical tradition would have answered the question, what's divine about divine law, by pointing to its origin in a divine will, a will expressed in history rather than nature. The attribution of divinity to the law did not in itself necessarily confer upon it any specific qualities such as rationality or conformity to truth or universality or immutability, right, unchanging quality. Some laws of the Torah are rational, but some are not. Most are particular to Israel and not universal, and they can certainly be adjusted as the need arises. So we have two very different ideas of divine law in antiquity, and they collide head-on after Alexander decides to conquer the eastern end of the Mediterranean in the late 4th century BCE. And that creates a cognitive dissonance that I think the West has been grappling with ever since and still grapples with today. So in my book, I examine the way various ancient adherents to biblical tradition, all Jews, struggled to resolve 
this cognitive dissonance between the biblical discourse of divine law and the very different discourses of their Greek and later Roman and then Christian neighbors. So if you look at the, I think it's at the top of page two or somewhere on page two, um, you should have a little chart that gives you the binary of the Greco-Roman dichotomy of divine and human law. So hopefully that's on there. Um, and you'll see that I've listed the characteristic traits of divine law, column A, if you will, and human positive law in column B, if you will. Um, and we'll see that they are counterposed. One is you know, divine law necessarily conforms to or is truth. Human positive law isn't necessarily truth. You know, it's grounded in a rational order. Human positive law is never grounded in a rational order. It's grounded in will, the arbitrary will of the, of the sovereign. That's the ground of its authority anyway. One's universal, one's particular, one is unchanging, one is capable of change, one is eternal, one is temporary, and one is definitely unwritten and the other can be written. Now it's clear if you look at that Greco-Roman dichotomy that the divine law of biblical tradition possesses many of the features in column B, right? What Greek thought would attribute to human positive law and only a few of the features that in Greek thought are necessary for a claim of being a divine law. And that mismatch between the Greco-Roman and the biblical notions of divine law I think was obvious and troubling to ancient Jews. And they responded to this mismatch in a variety of ways. There are three ways that we're going to consider. The first response we consider is that of Jews who fully imbibed and embraced Hellenistic values and the Hellenistic dichotomy here of divine and human law. Now most of these Jews lived in Alexandria, Egypt in the second and first century BCE. They spoke Greek, they adopted Hellenistic patterns of thought and culture, and these Jews didn't want to think of their heritage, right? They didn't want their heritage to be thought of, and they themselves did not want to think of it as anything less than divine law according to the widely accepted criteria of the culture that they so much admired, Hellenistic culture. And so they worked like crazy to shoehorn the Mosaic law, right, the biblical law, the law given at Sinai, into the category of natural law rather than positive law. And they attributed to it the characteristic features of Greco-Roman natural or divine law left, uh, laid out in the left-hand column there. The clearest example is Philo. We're just going to cut right to Philo to, to, to look at this. So Philo, he died around the year 50 of the Common Era. He was uh, an Alexandrian Jew who asserted that the Torah of biblical tradition possessed all the qualities of the divine natural law as understood by the Greek natural law tradition. If you look at text six, I've just sort of pasted together um, a few statements by, um, Plato, uh, by Philo. Um, and I will just review his thinking on this. First of all, he says outright pretty much that the law of Moses not only agrees with but is identical to the principles of eternal nature. And having identified the Mosaic law with the divine natural law, he then labors to demonstrate that it possesses the properties and qualities of Greek natural law. It's universal, it's rational, it's self-identical with truth, it's unwritten, that's, that's a really interesting one for him to claim, and it's static and it's unchanging. So how does he do this? How does he make these audacious claims? First, uh, to support the idea that the Mosaic law is the universal law of the, of the cosmopolis or the world city, which is what natural law is. Philo says, well, just look at its narrative context. Well, of course, he ignores its immediate narrative context. It's revealed to the Israelites at Sinai in order to set them apart from other nations. No, no, he focuses on the larger narrative context, which begins with the story of the creation of the universe. And he says that this clearly is a law intended for the universe since the lawgiver created the entire universe. Second, he mocks and scolds those who think the Bible is mere literature or myth or history or drama or poetry. And he states that scripture, in fact, contains the canons of rational philosophical truth. Right? You see that in the, third, uh, the second and third quotes uh, under, under number six. Third, Philo has to deal with the Torah's writtenness, which, according to Greek thinking, is an unfailing sign of a human law. So Philo asserts that the written text of the Mosaic law is simply a copy of an original unwritten law of nature. How does he know this? He knows this because the patriarchs, right, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, observed the law before it was ever given to Moses and the Israelites at Sinai. Now, if they observed the law, how could they have done that? 
Well, they did it because it's clearly natural law, and they were sages with rational perfection, and the rationally perfect sage, as we know, can simply read the divine law in nature. So if the patriarchs followed the Torah, and Philo says they did, despite some clear biblical evidence to the contrary, um, then that's because the Torah is natural law, and they knew it from observing nature. Fourth, he says that the law of his people has simply never changed down to the present day. So Philo responds to the cognitive dissonance I've described by asserting that the Torah of Moses is divine law according to the Greco-Roman definition or understanding of that term, which means it is rational, it is true, it is universal, it is immutable, it is even unwritten. The second response to this cognitive dissonance I'm going to mention only very briefly, um, and that is Paul's response. Now, Paul was a first century Pharisaic Jew who also was in the position of having to evaluate his native constitution, the Torah, against the ideal standard of divine law as defined by Greco-Roman tradition. But unlike Philo, he's going to conclude that the Mosaic law doesn't possess the characteristics on the left-hand column, A. It really looks a lot more like the second side of the, of the, of the page, right, the right-hand column, and has the characteristics of human positive law. It's a written constitution of particular laws. It can't possibly be identified with the universal, unwritten law of nature inscribed upon the hearts of all humans. In order to make that case, just as Philo applied all of the discourse and language of natural law to the Mosaic law, Paul's going to do the opposite. He's going to take all those discourses I described of human positive law and apply them to the Mosaic law. So he, um, and those are discourses that are marked by ambivalence and negativity, remember. So he describes the Mosaic law as being, like all other collections of written rules, lifeless, a dead letter that kills the spirit, a second best, a necessary evil that may rescue us from an undesirable state, he says, right? The law held the Israelites from sin for a while, but it can't bring you to full virtue. Um, it's inadequate for the inculcation of virtue. He echoes platonic pessimism, platonic language about the ability of human law, or really the inability of human law to bring us to virtue. Early Christian, the early Christian community will pick up on Paul, and they will continue this line of thought, and they will also echo Plato's language when they say that both the law and its human subjects are in need of a savior, a soterion, in the form of reason or logos. And it's no accident that John will identify Jesus as the logos, the one who comes to save the law and its subjects, right? So this is all taken straight out of sort of Platonic uh, and, and Greek philosophical traditions and discourses about law, positive law, negative. So Philo and Paul are similar. They both accept that chart at the top of page two. They both accept that binary or that Greco-Roman dichotomy between divine natural law and human positive law. And if you accept that, then you have to decide where to place biblical divine law, right? The, the Torah given at Sinai. And they just make radically different choices. Philo identifies biblical law with Greco-Roman divine or natural law and forces upon it all of the characteristics in column A, and none of those in B, um, particularly its alliance with rationality and truth. Paul makes the opposite move. The law of Moses, he says, possesses the characteristics of positive law systems listed in column B there. It's not eternal. It's not universal or unchanging. It's temporary. It can be set aside. Like all positive laws, it's even deficient as an aid to achieving virtue. We can dispense with it in favor of the natural law written on the heart. And so now we come to the rabbis of the Talmudic period, the sages who between the 2nd and 7th centuries CE developed the classic works of rabbinic tradition, the Midrash, the Mishnah, and the Talmud. And they give us a third response. In my book, I argue that uh, the rabbis just walked away from this binary altogether. They just resisted that divine law, human law dichotomy given by Greco-Roman tradition. And they construct a portrait of divine law in defiance of that binary. The rabbinic construction of divine law, or Torah, challenges Greco-Roman assumptions about the attributes of divine law, specifically the attributes of conformity to truth, universal rationality, and immutability. So each of those attributes is treated in a separate chapter in my book. One chapter considers the attribute of truth, 
and argues that rabbinic texts do not represent Torah as necessarily conforming to or self-identical with various kinds of truth. I will ignore for a moment the fact that we don't really have a Hebrew equivalent for the Greco-Roman notion of truth, so you'll have to trust me that after a lot of thinking, I came up with what I think are really three different functional equivalents in, in rabbinic um, literature for something like a Greco-Roman notion of truth. But I think the, the closest functional equivalent to Greco-Roman notions of truth are places where you see the rabbis referring to a kind of fixed measure or standard of some kind of objective reality. I identify three objective standards in rabbinic texts, which I call formal truth, when something has sort of logical or formal truth, like two plus two is four. Um, judi judicial truth, which is correctly judging innocence and guilt. And physical or natural truth, which is to say just sort of reality out there in the world. Right? And in the book I ask, does the Torah necessarily equate to or adhere to any of these three mixed these three measures of a fixed or a stable sort of truth or objective um, reality? And the short answer is no. Sometimes it does, but not always. We'll consider formal or logical truth first. In hundreds of rabbinic texts, early and late, Palestinian, Babylonian, there's an explicit conceptual distinction between the rationally or formally correct law, what they call the din, um, and then what the operative divine law actually would be. I'll give you one um, quick example, and I, I hope this is um, understandable. It's number seven. This is a short passage from the Mishnah. You're going to have to kind of just uh, um, allow yourself to be taken in by a rabbinic mode of thinking and talking here for a moment. Um, but just as a heads up of what's going to happen in this text that we're about to read, here we're going to see that the, the rabbis will say that the law produced by kind of logical reasoning, when you look at the text you look at the te uh, and you think what, the, what the logically the law should be, sort of in formal logical terms, you'll find that, in fact, Scripture doesn't rule that way. And it, it um, supplants the operative, um, the, the formal ruling with what is, in fact, the law declared by Scripture. Let's take a look at the text. So Mishnah Menachot, this is number seven on your handout. Meal offerings might logically be thought to require the purest olive oil. And here's the reasoning. For if the menorah, which is not intended for consumption, requires the purest olive oil, then the meal offerings, which are intended for consumption, well, isn't it logical that they should require the purest olive oil? This is classic rhetorical, um, you know, um, it's called kavachomer in, in, um, in the rabbinic text, but it's major to minor thinking, right? So, um, but, so you would think logically that a meal offering should require the purest olive oil. Formal logic would lead us there. But scripture says, and then they quote a verse from scripture, pure olive oil beaten for the light, which they interpret this way. <clears throat> the pure olive oil is beaten for the light and not pure olive oil for meal offerings. Bear with me. <laughs> now, there's nothing in Exodus 27 verse 20 <clears throat> which states explicitly that one... Um, but the verse itself just says that one uses pure olive oil for the menorah, for the light. But there's nothing in that verse to suggest that you can't use it for the meal offering. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> the rabbis massage that message out of the text. <coughs> if it says pure olive oil for the menorah, then it means precisely not for the meal offering. Well, that's not really what the text says. But they massage that teaching out of the text, and then they turn around and say, look at that. The text is teaching something illogical. Logically, the law for meal offerings should be X. But scripture declares against the dictates of formal logic that the law is not X. <clears throat> now again, scripture really does no such thing. The rabbis have coerced that <clears throat> illogical teaching from the text, and then they point out how illogical it is but yet it is never thus the law. This happens hundreds of times. They go out of their way to do this. It's a rhetorical choice on their part. They go to great lengths to manufacture scriptural teachings and then point out that they are illogical or defy logic. You could not arrive at it without scripture telling you what it is. You can't arrive at it through your reason. So they seem to be wanting to tell us that scriptural laws and commands are sometimes illogical. Isn't that wondrous? The distinction between the formally correct or logically correct law and the operative scriptural law continues in the context of judgment. 
when adjudicating the law, an uncompromising adherence to truth, the single correct answer that you would arrive at through abstract studying or theorizing, that's depicted in several remitic texts as dangerous. It is said that Jerusalem was destroyed only because people gave judgments according to the strict or formally correct law, Din HaTorah, when they should have stopped short of the short or formal or strictly correct law. They should have been lifnim yishorat adin. There's a passage that notes that Torah judges who render justice in a formally correct way that ignores particular circumstances, even though they're formally correct, they are deficient. Applying theoretically correct law, it is said in one text, can be destructive, cutting through mountains. The pious individual should contextualize the law, take into account such values as humility, compassion, modesty, peace, or charity. And sometimes the pious sage should forego his right to the theoretically correct norm or ruling. For in so doing, he can uphold other virtues, virtues that sometimes should trump truth. Even in the heavenly court, truth is not highly valued. It's a wonderful um, scholar, Ricky Hittery, has shown in some articles that there are many um, rabbinic stories that depict God in heaven, judging human beings, they depict God as more or less complicit in the defeat of truth when judging humans. In some texts, he writes, God would prefer to be persuaded towards mercy by a good lawyer, even at the expense of justice. Sometimes the advocate, and very often in these stories, the advocate is Moses. Sometimes the advocate resorts to all sorts of ruses and tricks and even bribery to avert a just verdict and to win acquittal for Israel, an effort that is depicted by the rabbis as heroic. God's defeat of truth in favor of mercy and compassion is extolled as a divine virtue. There's one passage in the Talmud that counsels that the most propitious time to come before God for judgment is not in the first three hours of the day because that's when he's occupied with truth. He's studying Torah. So you don't want to come then. You want to come in the next three hours of the day when he's not studying Torah and not occupied by truth. Um, and then he'll moderate his judgment and balance the demands of strict justice with other considerations like mercy, compassion, and love in a process that looks very much like the Greek concept of phronesis, or practical reasoning. In addition, the Torah's rulings don't always align with truth in the third sense identify, truth in the sense of physical or objective reality. There's a very famous passage that some of you may know from the Mishnah um, in which there is a conflict between rabbis over when to determine the calendar. The calendar was set according to the appearance of the moon, right? It was a lunar calendar, or partly lunar calendar. And so it was when you saw the, the new moon that would begin uh, the new month. And there's a famous story where um, Rabbi Gamliel knowingly accepts false testimony, somebody who gives incorrect testimony about the, the phases of the moon, um, over the objection of his colleagues and declares the, the calendar based on just false or incorrect astronomical uh, information. But he prevails even though some of his colleagues are concerned that it should line up with reality, that the calendar should line up with reality. In, the elab in an elaboration of the story, um, and this is in text 8, uh, Rabbi Akiva is said to find a scriptural justification for the right of rabbinic authorities to determine the calendar, even if in so doing they are misled or otherwise err, whether deliberately or inadvertently. Um, Rabbi Akiva said to Rabbi Joshua, the biblical text says, you, you, you. In other words, we have three verses in Leviticus that say you can appoint the calendar, basically. And it says you three times to indicate that you may fix the festivals even if you err inadvertently, you even if you err deliberately, and you even if you are misled. And Rabbi Joshua replied to him saying, Akiva, you've comforted me, you comforted me. It's okay for us to not always have the law be completely true. This is all, by the way, in contrast to sectarian groups, if you've heard of the famous uh, sectarian community that lived by the Dead Sea, whose writings are the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were adamant that the calendar actually had to be um, line up exactly with the, the uh, movements of the astronomical um, phenomena. In their legal system, the rabbis regularly tolerate counterfactual rulings and legal fictions, particularly when these help achieve humane and compassionate goals, such as the famous case of the woman who remarries after witnesses report that her husband has died. When he shows up again, one authority says that the court can simply employ a legal fiction and declare that the man is not himself, so that the woman's new marriage is not disrupted. Don't laugh, this happened in Ohio, actually, in the last five or 10 years. It's very interesting. The court de decided some guy wasn't himself because they had paid 30 years of death duties or something to his widow who could not pay it back. So anyway, 
Um, and fictive legal presumptions are also tolerated, such as the presumption that all women are in a state of ritual purity from their menstruation when their husbands return from a journey. Now clearly that will not always factually be true. But related rabbinic teachings um, suggest that the motivation for adopting a lenient um, stance in this case is connected with the value placed upon marital intimacy and the positive commandment of sexual reproduction, right? other values that come in and trump you know, the, the need for truth or objective facts. The rabbinic approach in these cases is typical of what we call a nominalist approach to the law, which is to say that objective facts um, are not consistently privileged when determining the law. Other considerations, other values are allowed to trump objective facts, all the more so when those facts are only likely but not certain. So the Torah or the, the, the divine law is not always necessarily allied with uh, truth in rabbinic tradition. What about its relation to rationality? That was, of course, another key indicator of the divine nature or the divine status of a law according to Greco-Roman conceptions. And here I have to be very brief, but let me just say that the Torah is not consistently represented in rabbinic texts as intrinsically rational and certainly not universally accessible um, by reason, something people can arrive at through reason. Indeed, in hundreds of texts, the Mosaic Law is portrayed as a divine decree, many of whose commandments run counter to the natural and rational tendencies of humans. You see this in text 9. Um, where Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria says, how do we know that a person should not say, it's okay, I don't want to wear mixed fibers, I don't want to eat pork, right? These are all prohibitions in the Bible, right? You're not supposed to wear mixed fibers, you're not supposed to eat pork. Um, it's, don't, you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't say that's fine, it goes along with my natural tendencies, I really don't want to wear mixed fibers, I don't want to eat pork, I don't want to commit an incestuous sexual act. Rather, you should say, I do want these things, but what can I do? For my Father in Heaven has imposed his decree upon me. So, um, this is, this is praised as, as a value of the law, the fact that it can be something that runs against your nature or be so illogical, in fact, as to inspire protests and even the mockery of other nations. We read in a very famous text from the Sifra of the other nations who ridicule Israel for these irrational or arbitrary uh, commandments. Um, sometimes Israel is compared to a slave who must obey the orders of his master without question or complaint. You'll see that in text 10. We won't read it now, but, but that's the idea. You are my slave, and therefore I and, and I redeemed you to be my slave, and therefore I make decrees for you, and you fulfill them, whatever they are, however irrational they might be. There's a passage. This is text number 11 from a later uh, rabbinic work, Pesikta de Rav Kahana, which is a kind of extended celebration of the irrationality of a particular law. This is the law of the red heifer. This is a law which says that um, which determines the ritual preparation of the ashes of a red heifer. Um, which is then used to purify persons from corpse impurity. Um, and in this particular passage, it's number 11, they ask, they take a verse from the Bible, who can bring forth a clean thing out of an unclean thing, right? Do something paradoxical. paradoxical. Is it not the one, like bringing Abraham out of Terach, or Hiskiah out of Ahaz, or Mordechai out of Shimei, or Israel out of the nations? Who did it? Who commanded it? Who could do this paradoxical thing? Is it not the one? Is it not the unique one of the world? And the same with the red heifer, right? Who could, um, who could possibly have this red heifer that defiles the person who prepares it, and yet it renders pure a person who has corpse impurity? Only God could do such a, an irrational and paradoxical thing. You can't think of anything more sort of anti-philosophical, right? So in all of these texts, um, there's no apologetic, um, no attempt to apologize for the irrational character of the law, as we see in Philo. Philo bends over backwards to argue that the dietary laws and the purity laws, they're not irrational at all. They're quite rational. You just need to um, interpret them allegorically. But they have a rational purpose, and they serve all sorts of important rational purposes. The rabbis don't do that. They celebrate the irrationality of the text, and it is obeyed because it is a divine decree. Finally, in the book, I address the, the Torah's relation to immutability, uh, another essential attribute of divine law on the Greco-Roman model. According to the rabbis, the divine law is not immutable. On the contrary, the Torah is susceptible to moral critique and modification. And the fact that it is so is the very mark of its divinity. How does this work? Sometimes the rabbis will state what the divine law is, and then they will set it aside in favor of a better ruling. Better in the sense of morally better. 
We see this in one particular um, tractate of, of this third century work, the Mishnah, which lists a whole series of ordinances that adjust the divine law for the sake of the social order or for the good of the public welfare. For example, although by formal law of the Torah, a husband is empowered to deliver a divorce document, retract a divorce document, annul a divorce document, without his wife's knowledge even, the rabbis rule that we may, he may not do so because of the social order. If he annuls a divorce document without a woman knowing, she might in fact think she's divorced, remarry, terrible things will happen. Um, another example is a slave who is freed um, by one of two masters, is technically half free by Torah law, but the rabbis say even though by Torah law he's technically half free, we compel his other master to free him for the sake of the social order because otherwise the man can't marry. In short, for the rabbis, the divine law doesn't always dictate the best uh, and most desirable answer. And humans are an essential partner in critiquing the law and making it better, usually based on an intuitive sense that the law is just wrong. In fact, the rabbis maintain that humans have the power to critique and modify a divine decree. Some texts are explicit in their aggressive criticism of the divine law as morally inferior. And there are some fascinating sources that describe God as being corrected by the moral insights and arguments of human beings. Um, there's one scholar named Dov Weiss who's um, examined 150, 140 confrontational texts written between the third and seventh centuries in which human beings confront God for the moral blindness of a particular law or a particular divine decree. In these texts, various human characters expose the moral imperfection of God and God's law. Sometimes God rejects or ignores the critique or argues his way out of it, but sometimes, quite significantly, he courageously admits his flaws and he adopts the more ethical stance proposed by his human interlocutor, and he modifies his behavior or his decree or his law in response. We have a text that's number 13. We're skipping over 12, uh, but number 13 is a great example of this, where God concedes to Moses' criticism of the principle of vicarious punishment, right? the idea that, um, that children are punished for their parents' uh, sins. When the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Moses, when he was um, describing himself to Moses in Exodus, that he is the God who visits the guilt of the parents upon the children, right? Moses said, Master of the world, how many evil people give birth to righteous people? Shall they take punishment from the sins of the parents? Terach worshipped idols, and Abraham his son was righteous. He gives more examples. Is it appropriate that righteous people shall receive lashes for the sins of their parents? And God said to him, you know, you've taught me something. By your life, I will nullify my decree and establish your word. So Moses expresses moral outrage over the principle of transgenerational punishment, and God learns from him and annuls his decree and establishes a new rule of individual punishment, and that's what shows up in the book of Ezekiel, of course. In another instance, Moses teaches God that it's best to sue for peace before engaging in a war. And God is said to adopt this policy in place of his earlier decree of making war without an attempt first at negotiations. And this helps account for, in fact, a, a glitch in the biblical text where we do see a shift. Um, other rabbinic passages contain human criticism and divine concession. It's because Abraham expresses his moral doubts about the flood that God scales things back. He moderates his behavior in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. In another text, God learns a lesson in compassion and altruism from Leah. And in another, when Moses objects to the severity of, punish, of the punishment of stoning for certain sins, God revokes the punishment and institutes a different punishment instead. In all of these cases, the rabbis you know, are imagining situations in which um, there are modifications of divine behavior or divine law as a result of human input and revision. It's a very short distance from the view that God consents to or is desirous of human assistance in modifying the strict justice of his own decrees to the view that he needs it. And there's a very dramatic illustration of God's dependence on human intervention um, to defeat him in the execution of his own flawed decrees that's found in our last text from um, Midrash Exodus Rabbah. This is a text that's dealing with the golden calf story. And according to the biblical story in Exodus 32, which I hope you know, 
um, the Israelites sin with the golden calf. And God is infuriated by the Israelites' disloyalty, and he declares to Moses his intention to completely wipe them out and start all over again with Moses. And he orders Moses to stand aside, but Moses doesn't. Instead, he implores, the Hebrew word here is vayachal, you'll hear a word play in a minute, so vayachal, he implores God not to destroy the people. And this is where the Midrash begins. I'm giving, it's not quite on our text yet. Um, but in, according to the Midrash, God desperately wants to forgive Israel, but he can't. He's trapped by his own law condemning idolaters to death. Moses, he says, this is not your text yet, Moses, he says, I took an oath back there in Exodus 22, verse 19, when I made the following law. I said back there, whoever sacrifices to a god other than Yahweh alone shall be prescribed, destroyed. And I can't retract an oath which has proceeded from my mouth. So Moses thinks really quickly, and he says, wait a minute. Yeah, but read a little further, because in Numbers 30, verse 3, you basically give scholars the ability to absolve the oaths of a person who petitions for absolution and expresses regret for having made a rash vow. Uh, and so having persuaded God to adopt this course of action, he also says, and by the way, a good teacher always ex um, models his rules for his students. So it would be really good if you were the first person to have an oath absolved. So... Moses prepares then to hear God's petition, um, and that's what the Midrash is describing here. This is your text. Thereupon Moses wrapped himself in his cloak. So now he's, God's going to petition him like a petitioner coming to a scholar to get his oath annulled. So Moses puts on the scholar's shawl like a rabbi, and he seated himself like a sage. And the Holy One, blessed be he, stood before him. I just always imagine God kind of hat in hand standing there before Moses, and he's petitioning for the annulment of his vow. What did Moses say to him? A shocking thing. He said, do you now regret your vow? And he said to him, I regret now the evil which I said I would do to my people, which, by the way, if you go back and read Exodus 32, God does say, or the narrator says he regretted the evil, that he, you know, he repented of the evil he said he would do. So the rabbis are picking up on that. He regretted it because he needed to absolve himself of the vow to destroy Israel. When Moses heard this, he said, it is absolved for you, it is absolved for you, there is neither vow nor oath any longer, and he absolved vayachal, the vow of his creator. So that word vayachal, he implored, they interpret as vayachal, he annulled or absolved his creator of his vow. This is an astonishing portrait of God trapped by his own law of justice and true judgment and dependent on the ingenious intervention of a human partner in order to escape the dictates of his own strict justice and divine law. So these texts from the third to the seventh century depict a fallible God, capable of error and at times in need of moral instruction by humans. Many people assume that the Talmudic rabbis could never have seen God as anything less than morally perfect, open to being corrected, subverted, or defeated by humans. But these texts suggest otherwise. Indeed, God is even said to need and delight in these defeats at times. The idea of a morally evolving divine being whose law should be subjected to moral critique and modified if necessary stands at a great distance from Greco-Roman conceptions of divinity and the fixed and unchanging perfection of divine law. To modify divine law on the basis of practical reasoning, phronesis, or considerations of equity or mercy or just good rhetorical arguments would have been nonsensical in a Greco-Roman context. In, in Hellenistic thought, the perfect natural or divine law is an expression of a uniform and flexible and changing order. It's universally valid. It just makes no sense to speak of its adjustment any more than it would be to speak of adjusting the law of gravity. In fact, Greco-Roman natural law theory envisages the opposite, right? The critique and modification of human laws in the light of the divine natural law. So we would never make a law, for example, commanding people to float in the air every Tuesday because we would have to modify that in light of the natural law of gravity that would make such a thing impossible. But in a paradoxical reversal, rabbinic sources depict, depict the critique and modification of the divine law, the Torah, in the light of human experience and intuition. It's the divine law that's adjusted on the basis of human wisdom and human experience, not human law on the basis of a divine wisdom. And the divine law changes and evolves not because it's imperfect, but because it's perfect a rigid, unresponsive law would destroy mountains and be imperfect. This is an important and radical idea. The rational modification of the law and the implied fallibility of the divine lawgiver 
did not negate the law's divinity or authority in the eyes of the rabbis. That's because biblical and rabbinic tradition locate their God not in static uniform nature, or not only there, but in dynamic history. God is intimately involved in and responsive to changing historical circumstances and moral considerations. The divine law's perfection is not diminished by the fact that it's particular, flexible, responsive, rather than universal, static, and uniform. Its perfection is constituted by those features, and humans are active participants and necessary partners with God in the ongoing evolution of his Torah. So to sum up, in the book I argue that the rabbis of the Talmudic era did not shy away from attributing to the divine Torah features considered by others in antiquity to be unfailing indicators of a human positive law. But unlike Paul, they presented this as a virtue of the law, not a vice. So in constructing a portrait of divine law whose very divinity was enhanced rather than harmed by its divorce from truth and its susceptibility to moral improvement and modification in response to the circumstances of human experience, they were entirely unique. And I think they were also entirely scandalous. To those who accepted the Greco-Roman conception of divine law, the idea that divine law is not self-identical with truth, is not universal and unchanging, is shocking, indeed laughable. And I believe the rabbis knew that. Theirs was a very self-aware choice. And I say this because there are many passages in which the rabbis depict themselves as being mocked by outsiders for their articulations of, of divine law that deviate from truth or rationality um, or objective reality. They knew that such features looked ridiculous to anyone who held that di divine law by definition conforms to truth or is rational or is immutable. Their ability to represent themselves as mocked by others who hold that other belief shows that they're aware of that alternative view of divine law and they are consciously rejecting it, allowing divine law to deviate from truth, rationality, and immutability. In the medieval and modern periods, the rabbinic conception of divine law uh, would be overshadowed in the West. The Greco-Roman binary of natural law and positive law, this becomes a controlling paradigm in discourses of law in the West. And um, these discourses of law are embraced by the three biblical religions um, in the medieval period, uh, where Greco-Roman thought really enters again and is really wedded with the monotheistic, monotheistic traditions, although in different ways and to widely varying degrees, much more so in Christianity, for example, than certainly than in Judaism. But we in the West are heirs to this Greco-Roman tradition. And most people today, if you ask them what it might mean to say that a law is divine, they will tell you, and I know this is true because I have done it, um, they will tell you, well, I think a divine law would have to be true, and it would make sense, right, be rational, and it would apply to everybody, it would be universal, and, and it would never change. Right? They will tell you that. And then they map all of those characteristics onto biblical divine law or Torah, the characteristic features of Greco-Roman divine law from a very different cultural tradition. And so for us in the modern West as well, the rabbinic construction of divine law can seem scandalous too, right? You thought some of these texts were unusual when you encountered them. Because a law divorced from truth, um, a divine law divorced from truth, a law divorced from truth and subject to change or evolution would surely have to be human. But who says? Perhaps there's something to be gained from bringing the rabbinic construction of divine law out of the shadows, from considering the possibility that a law and a text can be divine without being universal, absolute, unchanging truth. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. I want to ask a question about the Greek tradition, your view of it. I mean, would you say that the conception of the universal natural order as a law is more characteristic of the Hellenistic period? Um, perhaps the Stoics in particular. The Stoics in particular, absolutely. Stoics Rather than pre-Hellenistic. Absolutely, Stoic in particular. And I think, so that's why I did try to focus on Stoic, the Stoics and I brought Cicero's definition. Um, you know, the pre-Socratics give us a few concepts of a, of a logos in nature and, and, and Heraclitus even says that human laws derive from or, or, or 
um, animated by that logos. But it's really the Stoics who give us the, the notion of divine law with the definition and the opposition to the written law that I've described there. Then, in terms of just talking about positive human laws and the political tradition of positive human laws, I drew much more eclectically on Plato and other sorts of sources. Um, but for sure, the Stoic definition is the one I focused on in this talk here. In the book, I talk about other ones, but that's the main one I focus on. Well, I'm glad to agree with that. I'm saying if Plato and Aristotle conceived of the universal natural order as law, according to their view of deficiencies in law, that universal law of nature would have defect, would be defective as well, qua law, right, being universal. So he, this is where the word law starts to be slippery, right? So if we're talking about an orthos logos, right, a right order, that's, that's probably more the notion that we're getting at. And, to use, and that's why I like to, to actually distinguish by using words, the words legislation and law, mm -hmm. so that they're slightly different things. Yes. So, so, so I think when we're talking about Aristotle, and th I think it's better to think in terms of an orthos logos. They're talking about a right order, and there's nothing defective about that, mm -hmm. right? I see, yes. I think that's the better parallel to draw. The second best, I think that you show previously, the second best is really the first best. The second best is a recognition of reality, what we really need. And so the law is not imperfect because it's necessary. So there's a little bit of it. Um, you know, Plato is complicated, and he says more than one thing about law. And so sure. the laws is different from the republic. And um, I try to, I try to do a good job of actually being clear about that in the book because they are different. So I was being a little bit schematic here, and um, but I do think that he does. Um, there are places and moments in, in Plato where he allows himself to speak in, in more negative terms. So some, it's sometimes it's ambivalent, sometimes it's more negative. Um, and so in the book, I actually detail and I give a number to every single one of these discourses, and they really do shade from, well, law is really pretty good and certainly much better than the state of nature, too. It just never brings us to virtue. And if, if we all had the ability to make ourselves invi invisible with the ring of Gyges, none of us would obey law. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just it's coercive. It doesn't educate you. It's just habituation. You know, so there's a whole range of things, right? In fact, he even has two notions of why people um, sin or, or do the wrong thing. Um, whether it arises from the irrational part of the soul, in which case it really requires coercion and habituation to cure us of it, or whether it's simply ignorance and just requires education. We have two very different moral theories in Plato. So it's, you're right, it's, it's, a, it's a thick mess, um, the Greco material. I think I end up with 10 different discourses of law, and I try to break them all down. And in the end, what I do in the book is I'm not trying to give an account of the Greco Roman materials. I'm actually saying, here are a bunch of different discourses, and I'm, you know, they're coming from all over the place, including the Cynics. You know, I talk about the Cynics, I talk about the Epicureans, Plato, Aristotle, Stoics. They're all out there. And now, when all of those discourses come into conflict with the biblical tradition, what do ancient Jews do? Some, like Paulo, run to take these discourses and use them to help him make sense of the cognitive dissonance. Others, like Philo, are going to run and take you know, Stoic discourse and, and use that to make sense of the conflict between the two. So I'm less interested in giving an account, per se, of Greco-Roman thought on the question as I am sort of laying out on the table. Here are the smorgasbord of things that people said in Greco-Roman tradition that were available to those uh, Jews later who were, were trying to make sense of what their constitution was. How do I label it in the Hellenistic world? Right. I guess one thing that comes out that's interesting, though, is despite these very illuminating contrasts, there seems to be this fundamental universal problem about general rules applying to particular sure. cases. Sure. And then you get these different ways of handling it. Yeah, yes. Um, it's, it's sort of a universal problem and sort of not. I think the rabbis do end up being subversive and flipping it on its head. So rather than understanding um, this world is sort of a fallen state where what would be preferred and what would be best and the world of the gods or you know uh, is some underlying static perfect order and our world is this messy thing that comes into being and fades away and things are always shifting and changing and when you're dealing with the material world you can't ever have fixed general rules you constantly have to be adjusting and that's sort of generally viewed as a negative thing now some are more neutral about it it's just the way things are but in general it's contrasted with a more perfect 
static other. And that's what I think the rabbis are flipping on their head. Uh, they refuse to allow for a negative account for this situation. And they say, no, divine law is precisely that thing that governs us now in this world. It's not for a perfect static world. It is precisely um, a, a law and an order that comes from the will of the divine being that is precisely perfect because it's flexible, responsive to humans, and so on. Uh, it's not separate from, from that. So I do think there's a difference in the evaluation of those things. I was just wondering if you allow for cases in which um, the rabbis do use um, universal moral logic. Um, I'm sure you obviously know the, the Gemara and Sanhedrin where, uh, how do we know that um, uh, I have to give my life rather than killing someone else? And uh, the, as you know, the Gemara says, how do you know that? It's, it's logical. Um, and I think there are a few other cases in which like, the rabbis seem to use Absolutely. Universal logic. I was just wondering how you address those so, cases. Absolutely, and so that's why I say the the, law, the Torah doesn't necessarily accord with them. Sometimes it does, and it's a, and reason and logic are a really good tool, but they're not given the final trump. That would be to make um, an idol out of reason, wouldn't it? Right. So that's just a form of idolatry to always make that the trump card. So it's certainly important. And and look, reason is the tool of the, the main tool of the rabbi's trade, and they certainly borrow and use the tools of reasoning and argumentation from the Greco-Roman world. They were very much influenced by rhetorical argumentation and reason, but they had no illusion that that necessarily led them to truth. It led them to legal rulings and legal positions, but another argument could come along tomorrow and um, um, un unearth that or unseat that, and there might also be non-rational considerations that might be taken into account that would also trump the rational. So this, it's certainly not the case that they you know, think reason's unimportant, but it's not an intrinsic or necessary quality of divine law. So it is possible for divine law to diverge from the, the course of re reason. Very often, they'll be one and the same. In fact, there is a really one text that actually states this quite explicitly. I think it's from the Sifre Deuteronomy, which arrives at the law through reason and then quotes a scriptural passage which says the same thing, and they say, oh, look at that. We got it by reason and by scripture, right? Could have, could have gone otherwise. So this, the question is, is it intrinsically, inherently, necessarily rational? And the answer is no, it often is, not necessarily. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I learned a lot, and I would be interested in the question why one should follow divine law. So basically, what makes it's it... the basis for your fidelity? Right. And so in the Stoic tradition, you might say it's just pointless to go against this law. It governs the universe. And if you go against it, just, you're going to fail. You're not going to be happy right. and so forth. And in the rabbinic tradition, what would you say? Is it, so to speak, fear out of uh, fear for the punishment? Is it hope for reward? Or is it something else? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it is all of those. That, that yes was not a yes just to the last part of the question. It was a yes to all of it. So what is the basis, the question is really, so what is the basis for our fidelity to the law, right? By, by um, ascribing to divine law certain inherent rational qualities which are desirable, the Stoic tradition and other Greco-Roman discourses, um, base our authority in the quality or character of the law itself, right? Um, because it is, it is universal, it commands us, and it's, it's natural, we can't go against it. You can try, you're going to be pretty miserable and unhappy and terrible things will happen to you, as a, but as a natural consequence, right? Um, of, of trying to deviate from it. So you really can't. You can try to float in the air every Tuesday. You're going to end up with broken bones. Right? So, um, so that would be the, the stoic answer. That is not the rabbinic answer. Um, now, there isn't a rabbinic answer. I should warn people that the Talmud is a work of many thousands of pages. It contains the views of many thousands of sages, and so no one should ever tell you the rabbis say. So in fact, you know, I put an asterisk by every time in the talk that I have said that because for almost anything I find in rabbinic text, I can usually find the opposite as well. Nevertheless, there are certain things that are sort of predominant. So certainly there is a great deal of talk about rewards for performing the commandments in, in the Torah. Um, you know, the rewards are great. The master is urgent. It's, you know, it's not up to you to finish the task, but you know, neither are you free to desist from it. And, you know, there are lots of, lots of discussion of the relative merits and rewards of certain commandments and so on. On the other hand, there are plenty of passages that make it clear that one should not perform the commandments for the sake of reward. And in fact, you should perform 
major and minor commandments with the same diligence and enthusiasm because you actually don't know what the reward is, so forget about that and simply do it. You should feel um, a certain joy in performing a commandment for its own sake as an expression of love for God and not because it has any utilitarian end or telos. Um, in fact, you, you shouldn't do something with an idea of the reward in mind. Um, I see all of these things less as sort of philosophical principles, as psychological um, principles, as as efforts, and, and, and by the way, I think for the Stoics it is too, right? I, let's, we can dress it up as philosophy, but philosophy is also trying to motivate people and give them a reason for doing the things that they're doing and so on. So I, I see this discussion as coming out of very much of the rabbi's anthropology. Um, because on the one hand, they will say, um, you shouldn't do a commandment for the sake of reward, um, but, but from an internal desire. But if you don't have the internal desire, go ahead and do it for the sake of reward, or go ahead and just do it because you're supposed to. And eventually, you will you know, generate the desire. They're very realist. They're very pragmatic. Um, and so they will use whatever language and whatever inducements are necessary. But the ideal would be that one simply does something for the joy of expressing obedience to the will of God. And that's a positivistic account of divine law. Essentially, it's the will of the divine being, and doing it, especially doing it for no reason, um, is an expression of your fidelity to the will of God. Uh, my question is just, I think that in a way your talk has provoked for me the question, why is this, this particular view of the divine law that's held by the Talmudic Why rabbis? is what? I'm sorry? This particular view of divine law that's held by the Talmudic rabbis. Why, so your talk for me the question, why is it? What is the divine law? Because it seems like a cynic might simply just look at this and say, okay, so the divine law doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with the truth, doesn't necessarily have to be rational, it's unchanging, it's, or it's not, it is changing, it's beautiful. And it seems like someone might just say, well, it looks like these have all the marks of bad human laws. And so my question is, what is the, how does one know? Yeah. Why should you think so? So the, the answer would be, I guess what you're saying is, the answer that it's divine because, from it's a, because it comes from a divine being isn't really an answer. Is that what you're saying? That, that there, there must be something beyond that. Um, But if they don't meet those criteria, then how do you judge? And that's where the story comes in. So actually, that's one thing that I wasn't able to, to follow at all in this talk because you know, it's a 400-page book, <laughs> an hour. But one of the things that I talk about is the importance, and the importance of narrative um, in setting the conditions for um, the value of the law, and that every nomos has its narrative. Um, if you're familiar with the work of Robert Cover, who's done a lot of work on, on nomos and narrative, and that um, laws or a nomos um, only generates in us a, a sense of an obligation of fidelity because of the story that accompanies it. And that is, in my view, the reason that the biblical um, giving of the law is embedded in this very powerful story of a, of a sort of a romance <laughs> between a people, a very troubled romance sometimes between a people and its God. Um, and it's that, command, that, that relationship that is actually what commands the people and grounds the, the fidelity to, to the Torah. So that is actually a, something that is taken up more in the book and not something that I went into here. But I think ultimately the source of the authority has to do with the community's historical experience, what they believed and understood to be a historical experience of redemption by this God and that grounds fidelity to his, to his will. It seems like the follow-up question would be, what's so divine about divine will? About divine, divine will. Divine will, because when, mm. you get, when you got to that last passage, it reminded me of Zeus and Sarp. He's, he's ordained that he's going to sacrifice his son. He's filled with regret, regret and Hera has to make this deal. And, but we don't want to say that no. Zeus is similar to this God. Right, right. Um, so what's so divine about the divine will? And again, I would say that I would identify probably more than one answer in the rabbinic sources. So there are places in the rabbinic sources um, where they make strong claims about this. Uh, remember, they don't think that this God is just a big one, all-powerful God. They also uh, um, they do assume that this God is good, so that is another fundamental assumption I think of the biblical text and also of the rabbinic material. It's not just that there's one God who's all-powerful, but this God is also all good. So if that is your working assumption, then you can make all sorts of arguments about the fact that this 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 law that He gives ultimately somehow has to be something that brings about a greater good, and 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 that will do it. 
to a large extent. Um, so, so, and there was a second way that they, I would answer that question. One is the assumption that the law itself is good, and I'm forgetting what the other one was. Mm, if it comes back to me, I will answer you. So are, is there any indication in the rabbinic texts of, uh, I'm really questioning the description of the Talmudic uh, uh, interpretation is irrational. So is there ever any indication that rationale may be God's, God's not just arbitrary will, we, but has reasons. And we just hidden reasons. That so we don't know. That's one thing. I know and the people other are hoping the text does that. Well, then let me write it down. You can go ahead and ask your second one, but I know I'll forget. So go, ahead. <laughs> go for that. That's part. Um, so first of all, I just want to stress that it's not that they say that the law is irrational. They're saying it's not necessarily rational or irrational. So they're not embarrassed by the moments of irrationality in it, the way that the letter of Aristeus or Plato or Fourth Maccabees, all of those are texts written in Hellenistic, under Hellenistic influence in which you have a non-Jew, usually a king or a tyrant or a philosopher, and a Jew, often named Eleazar, and the, and the non-Jew will say, what is this crazy stuff that you don't eat? Pork. Animals are animals. By their nature, there's no difference between any of these animals. And they, they use language of nature. They're fuses, right? That there's, there's no natural difference among these animals. Why are you making distinctions between kinds of animals and not eating some things and other things? And they will bend over backwards saying, no, this actually is natural. You know, that there are distinctions between these animals inbuilt in their nature. Some, these captors and predators, if you don't want to eat from them because you're, invite, you're imparting certain moral lessons, that's why God gave everything here has a... Let, the letter Aristides uses a phrase, orthos logos, right? There's a right order and reason to this. Um, the rabbis just don't play that game. They're just not going to apologize for it. You say, right, purity laws and dietary laws are irrational. They make us different. And remember, that's one of the purposes of the law, to separate but us out from other nations. And there's, that's, but, but the point is, it just marks us. There's a telos, but it's not an intrinsic reason, right? Philo and, Aristotle, uh, Philo and Aristides are saying it's an intrinsic reason. It had to be pork and not something else. The rabbis explicitly say, why do we have to sacrifice a, a bird by breaking the nape of the neck? And they, yeah, it could have been done some other way. It really doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. The point is you do it because it's a command. Philo and, Arist and the letter of Aristides wouldn't say that. They would explain to you exactly why it's the nape of the neck and not something else. There's something intrinsically rational about it. So to, to say that there's an extrinsic reason that it makes us separate, that's not the same as saying it's intrinsically rational. Um, so again, they don't say that all of the laws are rational, but they are They'll live with the fact that there are certain rational things. They say this explicitly in the Sifra. There are laws in the Torah which, had they not been written, they would have been written. They should have been written. Like right? murder, incest, all the rest of it. All peoples have those. Those are rational laws. But then there are the laws that the other nations mock us for, like the purity laws and the dietary laws. So that's what I mean. They, they don't apologize for it. They recognize that it, it has both elements in it. Um, as for the hidden reasons, or the, that is an argument that they don't revert to. That's something that comes up in the medieval period. Right? In the medieval period, Jews become very uncomfortable with the irrationality. They go back to doing what Philo does and, and others, and they, they try to rationalize everything and say there are reasons for all the commandments, and they try to articulate them, and if they can't, they say, well, then it's a hidden reason known only to God. But that's a post-Talmudic phenomenon. We don't have this phrase, Ta'amei mitzvot, reasons of the commandments. Uh, we have it three or four times, but it means something different. It actually means a rationale written next to a verse in a biblical text. It doesn't mean what it means in medieval philosophy. Um, so they, they don't seek out reasons for the commandments. There's one place where they do say, it's a, it's a late text, um, and it's actually in this Pesikta de Rav Kahana, after they've gone on about the paradox of irrationality and how only a god could be so paradoxical. There is one little passage where they say that um, uh, Solomon was so wise, he understood the reason for all the commandments except for the law of the red heifer. That was the one that really stumped him, and he couldn't figure that out, but God whispered it to Rabbi Akiva so he knows. So that's like the one place you have the idea that maybe everything does have a reason, but it's following on a passage where they've spent a lot of time just praising God for the irrationality of the law. So. Yeah, yeah that, that would be a big one for Maimonides. So. <laughs> I have a question. player in the story and less of a legislature, more of Abba or instructor. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, and I think that goes back to this question of relationship, right? So I think that the, the grounds for the fidelity of Israel to God's law um, are sometimes better understood from the point of view of the relationship between them, which is sometimes husband and wife. It is sometimes father-child. Um, it is sometimes teacher-student. Although sometimes Moses is the teacher and God is the student, actually. 
in several cases, sometimes other rabbis are the teachers and God is the student. Um, so I think any of those relational metaphors um, go a long way to help us flesh out um, really what the rabbinic understanding of the nature of divine law is. And it's not something I could get into in this, this lecture. But um, I, th I think you're right. I think that's an important part of that story is the posture that they have towards one another. And the rabbis will employ any number of metaphors. Um, a king and his um, favorite counselor, that's another um, relationship. And that's a very mutual relationship. Sometimes the king doesn't know what to do. And Moses is a wise counselor who helps him. And yet he still upholds the honor of the king. And so we, they, they use any number of these relational metaphors to really ground, I think, the authority of the law.